Part 1. Link remained on Mount Lanayru the entirety of the next day and night. It wasn't enough time for him to process the memories, the details that had been lost but were now found, or the relationships that were now restored to him. It wasn't nearly enough time, but he could remember them. He doubted his memory was perfect. He could not remember every conversation he'd ever had, but he felt certain that everything that had been lost during his slumber had been returned to him. He could remember the day that Arl was born, and he could remember his mother teaching him how to cook. It began as making him help out with meal preparation while she was resting, after his sister's birth. She'd never been one to like having servants around, but he'd taken to it, even at a young age. He remembered the tears in his mother's eyes when he left with his father to go live at the castle. He remembered that despite his father's gruffness, he was a man that loved his family, both wife and children. He was also fiercely loyal to king and country. He had a slight limp in his left leg, Link hadn't noticed in any of his previously recovered memories, a reminder of an injury sustained not in battle, but in a simple training accident. Link remembered other family, too. He had an uncle that lived in Kasudo at the time. He had no idea, now, if he might actually still have family out there. His uncle had been unmarried and without children. And then there were the friends. Many friendships had been lost over the course of time, and as Link's responsibilities changed. Yet some friendships endured. He remembered Boz, Riven, and Gaddison. Boz had been one of his best friends when Link was a child. And he remembered his time with Zelda in much greater clarity. He could remember periods of anger and frustration especially early on. But he could remember moments of peace during those early travels, too. Things hadn't been as bad as he'd thought. But he also had the benefit of hindsight now. He could remember the slow, tentative bond they developed, beginning in Gerudo Town and expanding as they made their way back to the castle. They'd taken their time on that trip, and had learned much about each other along the way. He remembered falling in love with her, the not very subtle flirting, the hints, the teasing, the friendship that had blossomed into something much, much more. Nights spent under the stars, wondering if she could ever feel the same way as him, and days with her in the castle, growing certain that she did. Pearl would have won two more of her bets, though he wasn't sure if he would ever actually tell her that. He was willing to bet that Zelda would, though. Those two had been more inseparable than he had initially realized. When he finally walked down the mountainside and rejoined with spirit, Link felt as though he were a different man, yet the same. He still had the same experiences that had shaped him into who he was following his resurrection. The shame, the hope, the victories, and the defeats. But now he had reconnected with the man he once was, as well. They were very similar. He'd been more hesitant before, and certainly quieter, and Link understood better now the pressures he'd felt that led him to those traits. They were similar, yet different in strange ways. He'd developed a fondness for spicier foods now that he never had before. Some of his sword techniques had evolved and changed, likely due to the fact that he hadn't been able to remember being taught them in the past. He looked people in the eye more now than he used to. When Link looked at Spirit, he saw a bit of his old horse in him now. On that day, Link had rescued two horses, and he knew why he chose this one over the other. It seemed so obvious to him now, and he wondered if it had truly been a part of him that longed to be reunited with his old friend. I wonder what happened to Apona and Storm. We left them in Hotno Village that night, and we snuck away. He would have asked Simba about it sometime. With a faint smile, he realized that it might be the last thing he actually had to ask her about his past. Link brought the hammer down, driving the nail into the wood the rest of the way and stepped back, smiling at his handiwork. The nails looked as though they had all actually gone in straight this time. Before him stood an unfinished house, little more than a wooden frame. His contribution, so far, to its construction had been meager at best. When he'd arrived back at Hatano Village three days prior, 
he found the reconstruction efforts already underway. Bolson and his sons were hard at work, and even agreed to some temporary, and unpaid therefore unofficial, help from those without the proper naming conventions. Oh, look at that magnificent work, Bolson said, sauntering up to him and inspecting Link's work, which was only a simple doorframe. Good job, Linkson. Keep this up, and I might have to keep you around. Also, Bilson had taken adding son to the end of all their names, presumably for his own personal enjoyment. Hatsuno Village, for all the damage it suffered in the monster assaults, was already in the process of recovering. Most of its strong men and women that had survived the battle had gone to Hyrule Field, but some remained behind. Those of Bolson's construction crew that wished to help in the battle would be transported to Kakariko Village the next day to make the trek to the field, and Link would go with them. He didn't know if Hatsuno Village would ever be truly back to normal. There was talk about making the wall and gate a permanent structure built out of stone and wood, and the concerns over food shortages continued. As feared, many of the monsters had harvested any fruits and vegetables from the outer farms and trampled anything that wasn't taken. But they would survive, assuming they received the help they had been promised. So for now, they rebuilt. Many mourned the loss of loved ones, but many also rejoiced for having been saved by what had become known as the Grand Coalition. A coalition of 500 warriors was considered grand in this age. It was almost laughable, knowing what Link now knew. He could remember training with the other races while growing up. Tourneys and incredible training exercises with thousands in attendance. Hyrule had been such a different place once. Link wondered if it, like Hotno, would ever be quite the same as it was. He doubted it. Scars could take a long time to heal. He was living proof of that. But it could be something else. Something greater than it was now. Perhaps something even greater than it once had been. As the afternoon became evening, Link finally took his leave from the construction workers and made his way to his house, apart from the rest of the village. He didn't immediately go inside, however, but made a long loop around his property. He and Arl had played together on that open field, and Medelia, their mother, would scold them if they ran too close to the cliff's edge. Link started climbing rocks at a young age, using the steep, rocky hill behind their house as his practice grounds. They'd once had cuckoos. The old wooden coop still stood, though it had fallen into disrepair. He could remember his father's booming laugh as he watched Arl chase them. Link finally came to rest by the shallow pond not far from this house. He could remember seasons in which this pond dried up, and other times when it flooded. Even though he spent a relatively short amount of time here compared to the castle, there were still so many memories in this place. And he had them all. He sat there by the pond, skipping rocks across its surface for a long time as he reminisced. He wasn't sure yet if he should mourn or be grateful for the return of his memories. He was happy to know what he knew now. Thrilled to have his family back, if only in his mind. But the memories also brought with them pain. Not the raw, uncontrollable emotions of his previous flashbacks, but something deeper. They opened a hole within him that he wasn't sure could ever be filled. There was anger there, too, coupled with the hurt. Anger toward the beast that had caused so much pain. He'd felt hatred toward Ganon before, but now he felt something greater. Link would not rest until he saw Ganon destroyed. Even now, he wanted to travel to Hyrule Castle and challenge the beast. The Sheikah slate at his belt seemed heavier now, and his fingers itched and danced across its surface and selected the shrine nearest the castle. But he didn't. Not yet. He was intent on ensuring that everything was perfect. He would only get a single shot at this. And if he was being honest, he didn't fully know how he was supposed to defeat Calamity Ganon. How did one kill something made of smoky malice? Would the Master Sword work? He hoped that Zelda would reveal something to him when the time came. 2. Impa stood on the Sahasra slope, 
just outside of Kakariko Village and looked towards Hyrule Castle. There it stood, as always, its broken spires piercing the twilight sky. At least, that's what she imagined. Now, the castle was a dark smudge on the horizon. Once, she had been able to see the castle in detail from this vantage, despite the great distance. She had some of the best eyes in all of the Sheikah people. But now, even they had started to fail her. Such was the curse of age. She really should invest in a good pair of spectacles, but she hated proving Paya right. She turned, looking up at her granddaughter. The girl had changed following the Yiga incident, though one had to know her well to see it. It was amazing how terrible she was at hiding certain emotions, while she had grown so accomplished at hiding others. But Impa could see it. The trauma. It joined the other pain that Paya had always kept to herself. The pain of losing her parents and the loneliness she felt in her position as Impa's caretaker. Impa would take all of that hurt into herself if she could. She had certainly borne enough pain and regrets throughout her long life. What were a few more added to the pile? But for all her years, there remained some things that even Impa didn't know how to do. What do you see, Paya? Paya hummed softly. I see the flying divine beast. What was it called? Meadow. Yes! I see Meadow flying, and I think I can see the others. We're so far away that they're hard to make out. And the castle? Do you see Ganon? Paya shook her head. No. I can still see the malice around it, though. Impa pursed her lips, thinking. Ganon was preparing something. Likely a trap of some kind, but it was hard to say. There had already been some skirmishes with other monsters, though. The Zora had run into trouble on their way to Hyrule Field, a large group of Lizalfos that apparently swam to meet them in the river. They should still reach the rendezvous in time, however. The force traveling from Hateno Village had encountered more monsters in the West Nakluda region, around the Blatchery Plains and the Ash Swamp. They were, in all likelihood, remnants of the army that had been fought at Hateno Village, but they fought as if bolstered. Likely Ganon's own influence, as were many of the other occurrences around the nation. Death Mountain still erupted far more frequently than normal, causing the Gorons and their newly reopened mine more problems. Grandmother? Hmm? Do you? Paya hesitated and fidgeted with her hands. Do you think we'll win? Impa smiled faintly. What do you think? She remained silent for a moment. I... I'm scared. I've grown up my whole life hearing about how terrible the calamity was, and now that we're here... Yes, I understand. Life under the calamity is all that you've ever known. Paya nodded slowly. And Calamity Ganon is indeed powerful. Powerful enough that I've no doubt it would overwhelm Princess Zelda's power soon. The last time it used the Guardians to destroy much of Hyrule, but I'm sure it could have done equal damage by itself had it chosen to do so. That's what I'm afraid of. Can someone like Link even stand up to that? Yes, Impa said with certainty. After everything that we've seen him accomplish, I know that he would find a way. But gratefully, he will have to do so alone. The Divine Beasts stand ready to assist him, and the Princess will join the fight when she no longer has to keep Ganon at bay. Paya sighed softly. It is just so strange to imagine. Life without fear. Without Ganon. Yes, I know. But I believe that it will come. Finally. Part 3 Sedan, are you listening? Sedan blinked and turned, grinning at the diminutive spirit that was his sister. Sorry, Mifa. I was just thinking. 
She gave him a patient look and turned away from Ruto's control console. What about? The future. Sedan sat down on the floor. Seated, he was about eye level with Mifa. And what everything will look like once this is all over. Hmm. It is daunting, isn't it? I... I wish to be able to see it. Sedan looked at her. How do you know? That you will fade when Ganon is defeated. I don't, really. It's just I have a feeling. I think that this is why I'm still here. Once it is gone, my spirit will no longer have a reason to linger. Do you know what will happen to you? No, I do not. I have no more knowledge of the afterlife now than I did when I lived. Sidon frowned. He didn't like the idea of his sister just fading away. Does that scare you? Mifa remained silent for a long time. A little, I suppose, but I'm happy to. I feel certain that this is my purpose. Why I was created in the first place. That's not how you always felt, though. She shook her head. No, of course not. When I was younger, when I was alive, I should say, I had many other dreams. Sedan grinned, unable to help himself. Like marrying a certain alien. Somehow, even as a spirit, Mifa could look flustered. Well, yes. Yes, that was one of my dreams, and I'm so very pleased how widely known it has become. Sarcasm. Mifa did not resort to it very often, and Sedan immediately worried that he'd offended her. I'm sorry, Mifa. I'm sure that had things turned out differently. No, it's all right. I've long since come to terms with it. I did so even before I died, in a way. That is why I never gave him the armor. I knew even then that he was not my destiny. But you still love him. Of course I do. How could I not? They fell silent for a time. Finally, Sidon spoke again, his voice growing softer. I will miss you when this is all over. Mifa gave him a sad look. And I you. I do wish we could have had more time together. Well, Link just moves so fast. She laughed softly. Yes, he does say that. He never could be stopped once his mind was set on something. But I also wish I could have been there for you as you grew. Me too. Tedon, I want you to know that I am very proud of you. And our mother would have been as well. I have no doubt that when you take the mantle of king, you will lead our people with greater wisdom than any king that has come before. I believe in you. Part 4 Kaz flew high over Hyrule Field, amazed by what he saw beneath him. All four divine beasts, gathered together for the first time in a century. In an odd twist, Meadow had been the last to arrive, though Kaz suspected that had been an intentional move on Rivali's part. The Rito champion was so different than what he expected. He could see other things from his place, too. Guardians gathered near the castle, other groups of monsters beginning to prepare for battle. Some Rito directed by Teba had already began to harry the monster forces. No one wanted to have to repeat the Battle of Hatsuno Village here. My greatest wish has always been for my daughters to grow up in a world without the calamity, he thought, heart swelling. And it is about to come true. He'd spoken of it, dreamed of it, but a part of him had always doubted it would come to pass. In truth, he thought that he'd always been a bit of a hypocrite in this matter. He'd spoken to crowds, singing songs of hope for the future, while doubting them himself. At least he had until he met Link. Link had been a revelation to Cass. Something impossible made real. A dream in the flesh. Proof that there was destiny for them all. And what a destiny Link had. The man had power unlike Cass had ever seen, and it had nothing to do with his abilities with the sword. Though humble, he had a way of drawing people in. He pulled them along in his wake, gathering friends and allies in a way that most people could only dream of. Ancient barriers fell by the sheer force of his will. He was a man who befriended kings and queens as easily as humble bards. 
yet he would never actually admit it. There's a lyric there somewhere. Cass folded his wings against his body and went into a dive, falling back below one of the puffy clouds that had moved in to block his view. He pulled out of it as soon as he got below the cloud, however. Flying too low was dangerous right now. Even as he watched, a bolt of lightning appeared between the Boris twin humps and lanced out, striking out at a group of riding bow goblins that had gotten too close. They didn't truly seem to be cause for concern, but Cass had witnessed the Divine Beasts, Naboris and Meadow in particular, attack guardians and monsters nearby. Indeed, he expected that they would be strong allies in the coming battle, even before they turned their power on Ganon. What kind of world will our children grow up in? One full of tales of heroism, sacrifice, and victory, rather than impending doom. What a blessing that would be. He just hoped that his friend would have an opportunity to rest when it was over. Cass had a feeling that Link wouldn't do so, however. Not truly. No. He would undoubtedly be asked to do more when this was finished. Cass fully expected that the people would try to make him king, though he wondered if that was inevitable, anyway. The lengths he was willing to take for his love of Princess Zelda would become legend. Cass should know. He'd already been working on two songs about it. They would work nicely when paired with the tales of her love for him. An ancient hero, a calamity appears, now resurrected after ten thousand years. Her appointed knight gives his life, shields her figure, and pays the price. The princess's love for her fallen knight awakens her power, and within the castle the calamity is forced to cower. But the knight survives, in the shrine of resurrection he sleeps, until from his healing dream he leaps, for fierce and deadly trials await to regain his strength, fulfill his fate, to become the hero once again to wrest the princess from evil's den. The hero, the princess, hand in hand, must bring the light back to this land. The song lyrics played through his mind and Cass smiled warmly. His teacher's song. He still didn't understand how his teacher knew so much. How had he known that Link would awaken, again, or the source of the princess's power? There had been more to old Rao than Cass had ever been able to discover. But now that that song was almost complete, Cass had added to it throughout his journey. Verses about the champion and Link himself. Only a single verse remained to be written. The Conclusion Part 5 Mipha stood atop Ruta's trunk, looking out as her people gathered below. Each of the Reeses had set up their camps nearest to their respective divine beasts, with the exception of the Rito, as Ravali did not wish to set Meadow down yet. It was strange, considering how close she had been to her people, how little she'd actually seen of them in the last 100 years. She'd been trapped by that creature, but even after Link freed her, she was unable to venture far away from the Divine Beast. Her spirit was tethered to it. She could leave Ruta, but could only go so far. I could go down and visit with my people one last time, she thought, but then she smiled sadly. No, seeing me like this would only cause confusion and pain. Others besides Sidon had come to visit her aboard Ruta, but few of them seemed able to stay long. Speaking to a dead woman was strange to most. It hurt to see those that she had once called her friends looking so different. Koda was married now and had a child nearing maturity. Segin and Muzu had grown old. Even the members of the Baz Brigade had all grown up into fine warriors and friends for our brother. They were all so different, except for... M Mipha smiled faintly when she saw him approaching. Yes, she was wondering when he would finally join them. It took him longer than she had expected, but she could hardly blame the champion of Hyrule for taking some time to himself before the end. She made her way back down into Ruta's body to await his arrival. She did not have to wait long before Link rode the rising platform and walked into the Divine Beast's main chamber. 
He saw her and smiled. Her heart could no longer flutter as it once had, but she still felt a hint of that old anxiety. He would likely always have that effect on her. Hello, Link. Hey, Mifa. What brings you here? Did you just arrive? Yeah, I... Some things have happened, and... He trailed off, looking slightly embarrassed. She frowned. What is it? He pursed his lips, considering, and then met her eyes. It's my memories. They've all returned. Mifa's eyes widened, and her lips parted into a bright smile. Oh, Link, that's wonderful! How did it happen? Sidon told me that you had gone up to Mount Lenehu to try to recover them. He hesitated. Yeah, I... Can we go sit somewhere and talk? Feeling slightly flustered by the request, but also immensely pleased, Mifa led Link back out onto Ruta's long trunk and lifted them both higher up. A gentle breeze ruffled Link's hair, though she couldn't feel it. He clearly enjoyed the feel of it and spent some time just looking around at the gathered forces around them. But then he began to tell her of his memories. He told her of the happiness he felt at remembering his time with her, the other champions, and his family, but also of the anguish. He felt as though he'd lost them all over again. He spoke of the pain of regaining the memories of his sister especially, only to lose her again. Unlike with the champions, he would never have the closure of speaking to her one last time. He spoke of his sorrow, but also of his anger. Anger at himself for failing. Anger at Ganon for destroying so much. Anger at those who remained, who had done so little to make use of the time Zelda bought for them. Anger at fate for allowing this to happen in the first place. And he spoke of his fear. He looked upon Hyrule Castle, and Mifa could see him try to mask the slight tremble in his hands. He feared what failure would mean for Hyrule, for the people gathered all around them, for his friends, for the champions, and what his failure could mean for Zelda, the woman he so clearly loved. Mifa tried not to be hurt by this. She'd known 100 years ago that they were falling in love, and the things she had witnessed on the way to Mount Lanayru had confirmed that beyond any doubt. But now, well, he made little effort to hide it. You know, Mifa said, once Link appeared to be finished speaking, he looked spent, as if saying so much at once had tired him. I am not sure if I have ever heard you say so much at once. Link smiled faintly. I did used to be quieter. I was so overwhelmed by the burden. I wanted to live up to everyone's expectations. And I think you will. You've certainly always lived up to mine. He closed his eyes for a time, and when he finally reopened them and spoke again, it was with a voice thicker with emotion. I'm grateful that I had you growing up, Mifa. I wish things had turned out differently. You deserve better than what happened. We all do, but one cannot change the past, no matter how wrong it is. She reached out, placing a hand against his arm, concentrating on making it solid enough for him to feel. It took a great deal of effort and left her feeling drained, but it was worth it. We cannot live in our regrets. This is our chance to set some things right. Yeah, it is. His eyes looked out on the castle again, and she saw his resolve harden. They remained like that for a long time before, finally, he took a deep breath and let it out slowly. She saw some of the tension leave his shoulders. He looked back at her and smiled warmly. Thanks for listening. Mifa hummed a response. Of course. She returned a smile and removed her hand, replacing it back in her lap. Have my healing abilities helped you on your journey? Link's eyes widened. Oh, Hylia, yes. 
I'd be dead several times over if it weren't for them. That did not comfort Mifa nearly as much as Link probably thought it would. I is that so? Yeah, you... He hesitated and then smiled. You've been protecting me all this time. Must he say things like that? And with that expression? Well, good. I'm pleased to know that I've been able to contribute in whatever small way that I... Small? Mifa, I'm being serious. I'm alive because of you. The things that I've faced, I... I could never have done it without you. She felt as though she could almost feel her phantom heart racing. Did he even know the effect he had on her? Especially when he said things like that. She smiled, looking down at her hands. Good. Actually, that's something else I wanted to ask you. Can you... teach me how to heal others with it? Oh, Currents. That is the last conversation that I want to have with you. Part 6 Teba stretched his wings out, amazed at the strength he felt in it. It was as if the break had never happened. He tested it, turning it this way and that, lifting it above his head and rotating it. There wasn't even a twinge of pain. What the hell? Link, looking paler than he had a minute ago, and with a slight sheen of sweat on his forehead, grinned. His hands were no longer glowing with that soft blue light. Taba's arm didn't feel as though it had been dunked in Lake Tatori in the middle of winter anymore. It's just something that I picked up along the way. I figured that I should at least try. How does it feel? It feels... great, he smirked. Arth would spit up his lunch when he saw Teba flying around again. And what would Rivali say when he showed up on Meadow's wing? After the damn champion made light of his injury, it would be good to see his expression. Thanks, Link. You are apparently still full of surprises. This one is all Mifa. She's the one who gave it to me. Well, thanks anyway. I was about to start ripping my feathers out over being grounded. Link chuckled softly, nodding and turned to look out at the gathered Rito forces around them. I never had a chance to talk to you after the battle, but thanks, Teba. We wouldn't have survived without you and your Rito. Teba nodded. You're welcome. Glad we made it in time. A frown creased Link's forehead. How many did you lose to Meadow before I arrived? What does that matter? That Zora Prince is right. You try to take too much responsibility. I'm wondering if I could have done things differently, gotten there sooner. Naboris did a lot of damage in the desert because of how long it took me to get there, too. Teba snorted. Just like a Hylian to try to make everything about you. He turned, looking out at the Rito around them. The Rito that remained. It took him a moment to speak again. I was reckless. Canelli was right about that in the end. We lost too many, because I was too damn determined to win. You were just trying to protect your people. Against what? Teba shook his head. Meadow never attacked unless provoked. Maybe that would have changed in the future. It would have. Each of the Divine Beasts eventually turned against their people. Meadow would have been no different. Regardless, your arrival proved that I could have waited. If I had, you would have shown up, solved all of our problems, and the others would be still around. Why is he even having this conversation? He hadn't even spoken to Hearth about this. The only other that he'd had said such things to was Saki. But she hadn't understood. How could he expect her to? Link looked at him, his expression difficult to read. Finally, he smiled solemnly. You did the best you could, Teba. You had no way of knowing I was coming, and... Besides, it was your actions that told us how we could defeat Meadow's defenses in the first place. Who knows what would have happened if you hadn't tried. Teba harumphed, crossing his wings over his chest and looking away. Maybe. I don't think it was in vain. We all do reckless things from time to time, and sometimes others pay the price for it. A friend recently felt the need to tell me that a leader rarely has the luxury of knowing 
what the right thing to do is. A leader can only follow his heart and hope for the best. That's not good enough for me. Yeah, me neither, but... Link chuckled softly, shaking his head. <laughs> He's right. It's just like... What we're about to do here. I don't know what's going to happen when I face Ganon. I could fail. And if I do, then all of Hyrule will pay the price. But what other choice do I have? Teba remained silent for several seconds before looking back at Link, meeting his eyes. The Hylian had a strange look on his face. It wasn't excitement, but it wasn't fear either. Anticipation. Hunger. But you don't intend to fail. No, I don't. I intend to end this. Teba smirked. Good enough for me. I guess we just have to hope for the best. 7. Pora reached up and brushed a sweaty lock of hair out of her face. It was currently a deep maroon color, the result of a new look that she was trying out. Just the one lock of hair. She used to like changing up her look frequently when she was, well, younger. Or at least she had when she actually had funds to do so, which wasn't snapping often. The only reason she'd been able to afford the dye for this change was because the dye shop owner, what's his name, felt grateful for her contribution to the defense of Hateno Village. That, and he thought she was pretty. Click snap! It's gotten hot! She thought as she glared at the console underneath the Guidance Stone. The Nekluda Tower, which she had made Link go activate when he finally returned to the village, as there were quite a few living guardians still running around in the region. Still, she missed the tower atop the Great Plateau. There was always a nice breeze up there. Director Pura, Dr. Robbie, would you like to eat something soon? She ignored Simon. He was a nice enough guy, though a bit stiff. Too bookish. Useful, though. Great researcher. And he did make a good chocolate cake. But she didn't have time for cake, or anything else, right now. Her deadline was rapidly approaching, and she still didn't have root access into the Guardian's core functions. Oh, she could shut down a bunch of their individual functions quicker than the snap of a finger including their legs and propellers. Link would probably say that was enough, but it wasn't. She wanted weapons access, targeting. She wanted to put them back to their original snapping use. Hmm. Pura, what about this? Robbie pushed one of the books Link stole from the Yiga over to her, where he tapped a line of text. Already tried it. She tapped away at her Sheikah slate which was only showing lines of text at the moment. Keep up, Robbie. Did you? Robbie seemed confused. A fairly normal state of mind for him, actually. She liked Robbie well enough, but, well, he was the one that nearly got Zelda killed by that guardian. Yes, of course I did. I... Pura looked at the book and at the line of text that he'd motioned for. She had not, in fact, tried that. Damn. She tapped the book for a few seconds, trying to figure out a way to try it without making it obvious that she'd been wrong. You didn't, did you? Robbie asked, a grin appearing on his wrinkled face. You know, I liked you better when you used to always call me Dr. Pura. My apologies, Doctor. She stuck her tongue out at him, but then sucked it back in quickly. She had to stop doing that. She wasn't six anymore, after all. She turned back to her Sheikah slate, tapping in the new line of instructions. Simon, I'm going to throw you off the tower if you don't stop smirking, she said as she studied the new text to verify she'd copied it correctly. She could feel his smirk grow wider behind her. It was very similar to something she'd already tried. That was why she'd made the mistake. One could hardly blame her. And naturally, like that other one she tried, this would clearly not. Detecting nearby guardians. Confirmed. Twelve nearby guardians detected. Current directive, error. No valid directives detected. Reset. Click snap! 
Cora jumped up, eyes widening. That's it! That's it! That's it! That's it! That's it! Really? Robbie asked, eyes widening. Pura screamed in excitement, typing away at the screen, eyes wide. Reset confirmed. Current directives deleted. Please input new directives. She slowly lowered the Sheikah slate, turning her head to look at Robbie. I think we did it. Let me see. Robbie took the Sheikah slate from her, staring at the screen. He typed out a few lines of text and waited. Pura could see him visibly shaking with excitement. She was, too. If this worked... It's working, he said, voice lowered to a whisper. They're responding to the new orders. Pura, do you know what this means? It means we're about to make Ganon really snapping angry. She grinned, eyes flashing with vindication. It was time for science to have its vengeance. Part great. How long? How long in this person? How long had it been since it felt the wind? The heat of the sun. The sand beneath its feet. How long since... Since what? Thoughts melted away like wax, but no. No, no. How long? The princess. The hero. The battle. Machines. Terrible machines that shot light and fire. They ripped, weakened, subdued. And then the hero and his sword, and the princess and her power, and... How long? Days, years, ages? It had been a very long time. So long that time had no meaning. But no. No. That was not the last time, was it? There was another. A plan. A trap. A victory. A defeat. The hero. Dead. The princess. Powerless. The machines corrupted. The calamity. Triumphant. Why was there a prison at all? How long? It saw. It understood. The princess. The princess. She defeated it. She subdued it. She imprisoned it. She kept it from its goal. Resurrection. A body once more. A chance to roam the world again. To feel the wind. The heat. The sand. Frozen in stasis. Frozen in time. How long. Something was different. It could see that now. Outside of its prison, men and women gathered. Preparing. But for what? Its machines would fight them. They would... Machines. The largest ones, its puppets. Its shadows. Defeated. How? It... Considered. It thought... It saw, it remembered. Hero. 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 Not dead, not defeated, not gone. Alive. Always alive, always ready. How long? How long? Ages. Millennia? Longer, much, much longer. Again and again. And again, and again, and again, and again. Defeat, imprisonment, rebirth, defeat, imprisonment. Always ready, always alive. Again, and again, and again, and again, and again. How long? The hero was there, I could feel him. Watching, waiting, preparing, still alive, still ready. Hero. Anger, fury, rage, hate, fear. Hero. 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 Part 9. 
Zelda groomed to herself, self-awareness trickling back into her mind gradually. How long? How long had it been? She could remember the fight, the battle of Hateno Village. She could remember standing behind Link, using her power to support him, to give him strength, and... She could see things more clearly than he could. She could see the power of Ganon on each of its minions. And her intimate knowledge of the beast meant she could glean its intent before they even began to move. This was the greatest of the help she gave Link. Subtle knowledge that gave him that much more of an edge when facing the hordes. She wasn't even sure if he needed it. He'd shown with the spirit of the hero like never before in those few minutes of fighting. She'd been able to see it from the strange in-between place she mostly existed in. He and the Master Sword had become one, moving with a mastery unlike this world had seen in many millennia, perhaps ever. But then she'd seen the Lionel, that poor creature so tainted by malice that Ganon had been able to take complete control. Ganon's gambit, then. It would attempt to kill Link there on the hill, or so she'd thought. So Link fought, and Zelda assisted. Where Ganon controlled, she directed. Where it dominated, she suggested. That was how their power had always been. And it was why she, Hylia, had always defeated it in the past. True strength came not from muscle and power. It was found in firmness of heart. Courage under insurmountable odds. And a desire to protect even unto death. And then, when Link had released Ganon's malice, Zelda feared that she saw its other plan. A trap. That creature had been like one of its blights, an actual piece of Ganon, sealed away in the Lionel to fester, to grow angry, to plot, and, eventually, to attack the Hylians at the opportune time. And when Link had, literally, cut the malice out of the cursed creature... She saw Ganon's attempt to form it into a new shadow of itself. She'd attacked the Blight with her power, and Ganon sprung its trap. Assuming its focus was on Link, she hadn't expected its attack on her. Her mind was ripped from the power, flayed to pieces, and buried deep within. It had very nearly killed her. The agony she'd felt made her almost wish it had. But the power had remained. After one hundred years of constant battle, it knew to keep Ganon contained, though her mind had been thrown to the winds. She had no awareness of what had transpired during her time of near death. Even now she had trouble focusing. Seeing. It had gained a foothold in her absence, but to what end? It hadn't escaped. She mentally prodded her power. She appeared to be... whole. The memory of the incredible pain she'd experienced remained, but Ganon did not attempt to rend her soul now. No, it was still in its... She couldn't see it. She could no longer feel its mind, sense its intent. It was there, but she couldn't even catch a glimpse of what it did now. It was like a blank canvas. She cursed herself. This had been its plan, then, to form a stronger seal against her interference, and the seal was strong. She pushed against it, but it did not yield. Whatever it did in the sanctum, she could not see, but she knew. She knew what Link would find within, its body. How surprised she had been when she finally made her way to Hyrule Castle one hundred years ago to confront Ganon. The calamity had been strong, yet incomplete. It could have been more than it was, but it wanted something... else. Something different. A body. To live again. To think. To feel. To experience what had been denied to it for thousands upon thousands of years. And that desire, that willingness to remain incomplete while it built a new body 
to delay its complete conquest of Hyrule, it became Ganon's downfall. But now... She turned her focus outward. She couldn't see far due to her still wavering consciousness, but she didn't need to. Link was there. She could sense his heart. And in a moment, she could see him aboard Divine Beast Varudania. She could see the spirits of the champions, too, all present with him. It warmed her heart to know that they had one last opportunity to speak before the end. As her strength grew, she expanded her mind and took in the rest of their surroundings. Little pinpoints of light signified an expansive force of Hyrulians had gathered. Zora and Gerudo made up the majority. Their warriors eagerly anticipating the battle. There were some Gorons, most of them wielding tools of their trade, rather than actual weapons. The Rito had gathered as well, set slightly apart from the others as they often were. Then there were the Hylians and Sheikah. Even together, they were small in number. There simply weren't that many warriors left among their people after the Calamity. Zelda expanded her mind further, visualizing herself taking a deep breath. Her consciousness flowed outward, over the hills, the grass, the trees, the lakes, the mountains. She could feel Hyrule. The whole land anticipated what the next day would bring. Death Mountain erupted. The ground quaked. The winds blew. Clouds broke. The moment that the land had patiently waited for had, after one hundred long, painful years, finally arrived. <laughs>